Okay, this, does anybody by any chance, is anybody familiar with this show? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's actually on HBO right now. Okay. Yes. Are they still playing it? Oh, yes. Uh, you can probably see them better on the side monitors, but this is a great character, Nucky Johnson, who's actually the county treasurer for Atlantic City County in uh, New Jersey. And for about 11 years, he, it's Nucky Thompson, isn't it? Nucky Thompson, yeah. He ran the show in that town. Uh, and he took a cut from all the booze that was sold. Of course, this was Prohibition days. But Atlantic City was wide open. He had uh, contacts with the mobsters, the prostitution, uh, the gambling, everything he would take his cut out of. And the way the show develops it is, is very realistic. In fact, Atlantic City had a big meeting, and I think that was uh, pictured on the show too. I didn't get to see it, maybe you did. Al Capone came into town from Chicago, and the big deals from New York, and all the mobsters around the country had this big convention in Atlantic City. And he was the one who was calling the shots. Uh, of course, what do you think happened to him? Uh, about 1931, some tax problems came along. They probably haven't gotten to this <laughs> show yet. <laughs> and, and he ended up going to jail. Uh, but of course, they didn't understand that much about getting the money back from these guys back then. So he spent his last days in one of the top floors of one of the big hotels there in the city, so living the high life. Uh, they still have high regard for him. Uh, my wife and I go to this. Uh, this restaurant in Atlantic City, we really like it a lot. It's called The Knife and the Fork. And in fact, it was mentioned on the TV show. And they advertise, Nucky ate here, shouldn't you? So we're really <laughs> proud of their lobsters. <laughs> and look, if you get there, lobster thermidor. It's great. They've redone the whole thing just like it was back in the 1920s. It's really fun. Well, part of what we're talking about here is getting back the money and I'm going to talk about how to get it, but now I'm going to tell you why I'm interested in it. Uh, this is Tammany Hall, New York City. Uh, remember Boss Tweed was back in the 1800s and starting the Civil War. This is one of the bosses. Look at, it's an octopus. I love this picture. I use it a lot. See how they have the arms going into everything, the police, the taxes. And this particular guy owned these big stables in the states and on the bottom, but it's not here, the cartoonist put in. It takes a lot of money to run those big estates and stables. But since I'm in Kansas City, I had to talk about Tom Perkins. And he is, uh, I can, he's, he's like one of the best. He was one of the top mobsters of all time. I mean, everybody thinks all he was was a town boss for 20 or 30 years. Not true. He was tied in with the mob left and right. People think that he was involved in ordering several hits on mobsters who were trying to get in on his territory. That's not to say he didn't do a lot of good things for Kansas City and for Missouri. In fact, I saw one, uh, as I was preparing to come here, I saw one survey that said he was the most influential Missourian of the 20th century. One of the people he helped get into power was somebody who was failing in his haberdashery, a guy named Truman, <laughs> Harry Truman. Uh, and he sponsored his political career right up to the vice presidency. Tom died. Oh, he was also convicted, but he only spent about a year in jail. He, uh, and his machine was mostly dis dismantled around the late 30s and the early 40s. Uh, but he did die eventually in 1945, and only one public official came to his funeral, Vice President Harry Truman. And you know, that said a lot about Harry Truman, that he would uh, stick with his friends. In fact, that's what, when he was interviewed, that's what he said. He said, Tom Pendergast was always a friend of mine, and I was a friend of his. And it almost cost him an election because it became an issue in the presidency election when he had to run. And uh, he stuck by it, and he squeaked that one out, too. So good for Harry. Now, it's not just internationally. It's not just domestically in all these 
in the United States cities, there's these books that have been coming out for the last 10 years. Why is foreign aid not working? Why have we spent 60, 60? No, you know what? It's not 60. It's almost a trillion dollars in the last 60 years. And what have we got for it? A lot of these countries are poorer than they were 20 years ago. Why? Why is it like that? What happened to all our money? Well, here's a good example of what happened. In 2004, a survey tracked money released by the Ministry of Finance in Chad intended for rural health clinics. Amazingly, less than 1% of it reached the clinics. 99% failed to reach its destination. We're talking about thievery on a grand scale. <laughs> the leaders of many of the poorest countries in the world are the global super rich. In Angola, there was a study of the top 20 richest people there. 17 were government employees or former government employees. So one of the jokes in this industry is, you know, in America, people uh, get rich so they can go into politics, like the Kennedys and the Roosevelt's and the Bushes. But in these African countries, people go into politics so they can get rich. And it's all at the expense of their, of their <clears throat> fellow country. So that's not just that book. The Fate of Africa. Uh, Africa has suffered grievously at the hands of its big men and ruling elites. Their preoccupation above all has been to hold power for the purpose of self-enrichment. So you wonder why people like Gaddafi can't leave? Why they have to stay there? <laughs> well, because if they do leave, they're going to get sued. And if they do leave, the people that come behind them are going to come after them for all the money that they have. So they have to stay in power. Here's another one, it's tribalism again. It's, that's a phrase in Kenya. You know, when our group gets elected, we're gonna rip everybody off because it's our turn to eat. Another one, why foreign aid isn't working. The answer here, and the reason I like this one, the world's greatest gift to Africa's Democrats would be to stop the amassing of illegal fortunes by its politicians and senior officials in foreign banks. So their answer is, get the money back. That's his number one recommendation out of 10. No, that's not Pendergast. That is an orangutan. And why do I have this orangutan? Well, because corruption, it turns out, makes him very sad. Why? Well, because they're cutting down his rainforest, and most of that logging is illegal. And in fact, at present rates, the tropical rainforest in Indonesia, once the world's second largest, are going to be totally logged out in 10 years. He's not going to have any place to live. Now, if you don't care about the forests, why should you care about this corruption issue? Well, poverty and disease. This is the World Bank. Countries that tackle corruption and improve their rule of law can increase their national incomes by as much as four times in the long term. And child mortality can fall as much as 75%. That's a powerful statistic. If you don't care about poverty, disease, or the environment, how about wars? Do you care about wars? It costs the United States to be involved in these wars. And this is just one of the latest. When did this one come out? 14 June 2010. What's causing the violence? A succession of corrupt, repressive regimes and chronic poverty. Poverty is called by, caused by the corruption. Are at the root of their troubles. Let's get even more current. If you don't care about the wars, maybe you care about our own standard of living, which is going to be affected by the euro collapse in any day now, which has been started off by Greece. And what started off that? Corruption is widely regarded as one of the triggers of the Greek debt crisis. You know, they don't even believe in paying the taxes in Greece. I'm not going to get into that.
So what do I think is the answer? And it's why I asked Saul this question. You know, those prosecutors seem to think the answer is throwing people in jail. And up until recent years, they didn't really think about getting the money back. And why? The like getting the money back complicated their prosecution. It's, it's that white collar stuff. You have to concentrate on that. And why can't I just do enough to prove the crime? Why do I have to prove how much was lost and where it should go back to? And who cares about the money? Well, the bad guys care about the money. The worst feeling is when our money is taken away from us. The worst feeling. People prefer to be put behind bars and keep their money than to stay free without the money. How about that? Well, if somebody told you you could keep $10 million and I'll spend three years in jail, would you keep the $10 million and spend the three years? Yeah, a lot of people would. This guy would. Mutolo. He looks like a mean fellow. He was a mean fellow. But, to his credit, he did turn around in those mafia commission hearings in 1992. And he gave us, gave the Italians a lot of good evidence. And he turned around and even testified before the US Congress after that. So I kind of liked him in the end. But I certainly liked the way he put it all together in just a few sentences. Well, a lot of people believe that is now the answer. Let's get the money back. So believe it or not, there is a United Nations Convention Against Corruption. This is the cover of the convention. And it's signed by 154 countries. The only people who haven't really signed it or ratified it are these little countries in red, maybe like North Korea over here and Somalia over here. But Germany has signed it. Ireland has signed it. Japan has signed it. But they haven't ratified it yet. So I'm curious about why that hasn't happened yet. Germany, that's an odd one. OK, it wasn't just Jack Smith telling you corruption is a big problem in this, on this planet. This is the preamble to the convention now, signed and ratified by 154 countries. Why? They are concerned about the seriousness of problems and threats posed by corruption to the stability and security of societies, undermining the institutions and values of democracy, ethical values and justice, and jeopardizing sustainable development and the rule of law. They've got eight provisions in the convention, general provisions, preventative measures, international cooperation, and my favorite, SF code. And of all those provisions we just went through, and there's 71 all together, the one that's a fundamental principle, states parties shall afford one another the widest measure of cooperation and assistance in this regard, and the regard is asset recovery. So people of the United Nations have figured out that if you want to do something about all these problems and more that I just ran through, wars, poverty, disease, the environment, you got to get on corruption. And the way you get on corruption, the fundamental way to do it, asset recovery. Now, one of the things we want to do to make sure that we can do some proper asset recovery and that the banks not be loaning people, not be loaning money to criminals, is we want to have enhanced scrutiny of officials with prominent public functions. And we call them PEPs, politically exposed persons. So every bank in the, who signed this, and in the United States for sure, every time we get a politically exposed person coming in uh, to put money in our bank or to deal with our bank, we're supposed to get enhanced scrutiny. Oh. But is that working? Well, this came out, I just happened to see, yesterday, <laughs> as I'm coming in here. Four Swiss banks broke the director asset rules. And so how did they find out? Well, you know, the, all these assets are supposed to be frozen. So the Swiss are now checking 
to see what money is in the Swiss banks. And they're finding out that four of their banks have not complied with the Swiss rules regarding politically exposed persons. So that's just in this quick little survey. And you think that's happening in Switzerland, well, it's happening all around the world. We no longer have a bank, which used to be the oldest institution in Washington, D.C., not too far from where we used to work, Mr. Black, called Riggs Bank, who, that bank, was the oldest bank in Washington and was making all these loans and keeping all these deposits for politically exposed persons without filing any suspicious activity reports with the government like they were supposed to do. And when people found out, they found out that, oh my goodness, what are all these millions belonging to Pinochet doing here? Oh my goodness, what are all these millions belonging to uh, Equatorial Guinea doing here? And even more millions. And, uh, more than the GDP of Equatorial <laughs> Guinea. The, the, the officials at that particular bank didn't see any problem with it. Well, that particular bank got fined, what, $25 million? Turned out there was this guy at the uh, OCC who was supposed to be somewhat responsible for the regulation who ended up working over there, too. That was a little bit suspicious to me. I hate it when I see that. Okay, everybody froze. You thought we froze Gaddafi's billions? Well, now they're finding out that, uh, gee whiz, as of October 20, they really can't find the money. And they estimate that's 33 billion to 60 billion in unaccounted money. I mean, people might say a little 33 billion, that's not that much. Of course, it's right, available to look for. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Let's use them. So one of the tools that we have, and the convention talks about it a lot, if you want to get money back, you have to use internationally something called mutual legal assistance. And there's these, we call them MLATs. There's these MLAT treaties, mutual legal assistance treaties. And you can go in, and uh, if you're a country in Africa, let's say we're in the United States, and one of our officials were suspicious about it. We can't write a letter to Switzerland and say, Hey, check all your banks and see if you have anything on, on the vice president. Uh, no, they're not going to do that. But if you institute a proceeding, you don't even need to have a conviction or a verdict. All you have to do is have an investigation properly authorized and bring it. Then they'll look for you. But don't ask them, oh, just check all your banks and see. Let's do your homework back here at home, do your investigation, tell them what banks to go look at, and you're more, much more likely to get something uh, fruitful between those people. What's also interesting here is, Bill will love this, the UNCAC prohibits the use of bank secrecy as grounds to deny mutual legal assistance. People used to be I'd love to say, we can't tell you about that because the money's in our banks. And you know, we here in Switzerland have these bank secrecy laws, or we here in Liechtenstein have these bank secrecy laws. <coughs> no longer. Uh, Switzerland and Liechtenstein, if you give them a proper request, they will give you the information. Do you have a question? Hey, Switzerland and Liechtenstein were signatories to the treaty that yeah. they ratified? Mm -hmm. Switzerland was rather late to sign it, took a month a little while longer to figure out they can really do this. They still have bank secrecy laws. Oh, yes. And, but think about it for a minute. Why would Switzerland be so willing to crack down on, on this corrupt money? Do they have any bigger problems in Switzerland? Well, that German money. It looks like a war. The corrupt money, not bigger than that. The corrupt money is nothing compared to the tax evasion money that's been stacked in Switzerland by the German citizens and by the French citizens and by the US citizens. So if you've been reading the newspapers, you would see that there's been some agreements in the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, the US was ready to indict uh, UBS because it wouldn't turn over information on US citizens who had accounts in Switzerland. 
but now they have an agreement on that. So if I was some U.S. citizen who thought that we would be very clever and get away with uh, stashing a few hundred million in Switzerland, I'd worry about that now. If it's that much money, the odds are Treasury Department and Justice Department have your information by now. The German equivalent of the CIA also paid. The oh, he knows the this story. <laughs> And did you object to that? No. I didn't object to it. I thought it was perfectly legitimate. But people put basically thumb drives in and <coughs> took out of both of these countries lists of very prominent tax evaders and turned it over uh, for a payment to the equivalent of the German CIA. And the payment was not that much. A million dollars. A million dollars to collect billions. Right after that broke. Of course, several prominent German politicians resigned because, like the head of the post office, he had an account. <laughs> there he is, running the government. Okay, fine. Okay, the uh, UNCAC has also got some pretty powerful language on confiscation. And states parties were supposed to cooperate with each other to actually confiscate, not just to report actually confiscate the illegal money. And why is that important? Okay, here's one of my favorite stories. This guy is uh, Mobutu. So a lot of us should remember Mobutu. He's one of the bloodiest, most corrupt dictators of all time. Um, he was from a country called Zaire at the time, now called the Congo and reputed to have stolen from his countrymen maybe $5 billion. Well, the Swiss, they looked, and they found a total of $7 million. Or what was it then? 7.7 .7 million Swiss francs, but that's when the dollar was. And the Swiss franc was like $1.20. <laughs> what is it now, 90 cents? So it's uh, at least $7 million. And, uh, so the Swiss wanted to give the money back to the Congo. They had the money frozen for 11 years. They couldn't get the Congo to even institute an investigation. <laughs> On the, this guy had been dead since, what, 1997, 1998? <laughs> they couldn't even get an investigation instituted. Finally, statute of limitations were running and everything else. The Swiss gave the seven million not back to the Congolese, who I can assure you can use the money, it's one of the first countries on the face of the planet. They gave it to the family of Mobutu, who has probably got the rest of that five billion stashed away all over the planet, and they didn't even leave, need the seven million, did they? But we couldn't even get back seven million dollars to Congo. Now, so you're reading in the paper, oh, look at all this Arab Spring money that's been frozen. Do not believe that because you can freeze an account, you are going to get the money back to the victim country. Eleven years. Just remember that case. I'm not even going to start on Duvalier from Haiti. Oh, but I will tell you, since I told you about a case that didn't work, let's talk about a case that did work. Sani Abash. Hey, well, he's a piker. Only three to five billion from the Central Bank of Nigeria that he embezzled, maybe, for security and political needs. Took it. And this is talking about the mechanisms that he took, out, that how did he get it out there? Cash and traveler's checks, bulk cash smuggling, commercial bank transfer, cash swaps, transfers via straw men. The structures, <coughs> multiple accounts, shell companies and offshore accounts, trust vehicles, properties, investments and bonds. A lot of money. Where have we found the money? Yeah, you can trace this money. A lot of people tell you you cannot trace it. You can. Well, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, UK, Jersey. The other Jersey. Yes, I'm not the live end off of TV. You've probably been there. <laughs> Recovery, so far. I say so far because there's another billion that's still frozen. Uh, 
750 million. The family. Geez, the families, they always have the money, don't they? Well, the families obviously got maybe one and a half, two billion at least. I don't know as associates how much they were going off with. Uh, so the families, nice settlement. We got $750 million. They got to keep $750 million, probably. But try to litigate with them, and the money disappears. <laughs> Uh, litigation could go on for 20 years. Would you rather have your 750 million now, or maybe 750 million 20 years from now, or well, maybe nothing? Uh, 1.5 billion through criminal and civil court processes. Again, what got in our way? Abasha family members, government officials didn't want to help. The banks, of course, didn't want to help. Difficulty following the asset trails, but. They know where, I'll bet you they know where 80% of the money is. Keys to set successful recovery. This one's the biggest key. Switzerland decided to help. They, they actually appointed a special counsel and paid for it, a Swiss lawyer to help them figure out where the money is and get it back to them. Uh, okay, Bill will like this one. Okay. Probably in some of your lectures, you got a better slide than me, I'll bet you. Stanley Sporkin, great judge at the time, was handling the 1990 Lincoln Savings and Loan case, and uh, he made this statement. Questions that must be asked are, hey, where were the professionals? Where were the lawyers and the accountants? And what is difficult to understand is that with all the professional talent involved, both accounting and legal, why at least one professional would not have blown the whistle to stop the overreaching that took place in this case. Hey, come on, people, we're lawyers. We're supposed to be protecting the public interest. We're not supposed to get involved with criminal activity. We don't have to do that. Accountants? <laughs> Accountants, they're the first line of defense out there. How come not one guy stood up? Well, accountants have paid a lot of money, not just in this case, but for other savings and loan and bank cases. We'll get to those numbers in a minute. Okay, here's a, a starting list, and there are more aiders and abettors. Judge Sporkin's talking about them. Whenever you got a case where you want to recover money for a bank fraud or any other kind of fraud, it's international fraud. Look to the people that help them. Lawyers, accountants, realtors, escrow agents, lobbyists, offshore corporations, even universities, banks. All those people may be liable. Okay, here's what we put down as the four stages of asset recovery. This is probably the most important slide here. You can remember this one. No, I got one I think is more important. We'll go through these stages one by one. Investigate to determine losses and extent of illegal fraudulent activity. And I'm going to use the FDIC example because that's where I worked and that's the one I'm most familiar with. Well, we can figure out we got losses. Here was the FDIC deposit fund in 2007. Looks like $52 billion we had in our fund to uh, save banks. Here, 2009 is the amount. Negative $20 billion. OK, we can figure out we got some losses there, folks. That wasn't very hard. Now we got to figure out who caused the losses, and that's not very hard either. Total bank failures since 2007. When I left in 2006, there were zero. So I figured it was getting boring there, time to leave. I wouldn't even have stayed for the three in 2007. But look at that, it started to grow up 25, 140, 157, 84 so far in 2011. Losses to the fund, to the bank insurance fund, almost 82 billion. Okay, we've got losses. We need to start to get back as much as we can. So, 
every single institution that fails, every one of these, 409 since 2007, gets investigation started on it. I wonder why they don't do this this way at the SEC bill. Not just one investigation. Look at these. Directors and officers liability, fidelity bond. Let's look at the lawyers, special investigation for them. Let's look at the accountants, mortgage malpractice fraud, securities brokers, commodities brokers, insurance companies, insurance issuers. <clears throat> Anybody else we think might have contributed to the failure of this bank? This is how it should be done everywhere in government. What you do is you follow the money for every investigation. That's what it works. It worked from Boss Tweed, there he is, Tammany Hall, <coughs> who ruled the roost there since the Civil War. What happened to him? Went to jail. Actually died in Ludlow Prison in New York City. Uh, for what? Embezzlement. The guy knew how to steal money. He was never even the mayor of the city. All he was was a, a politician there. He had some minor jobs, like he would become the head of the uh, head of services. And he would, okay, I'm head of services. I'll hire some friends. I'm going to create 12 new jobs to remove manure from the streets. Control boats that way. The guy was so rich that he owned one third of all the real estate in New York City. Remember what I said they do in Africa? Why do we go into politics? So we can get rich. Ah, another one. These cartoons were coming out. The cartoonists were so upset at all this corruption. They are the people who really helped to get rid of people like Ross Tweed. This is one after the St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago. And, uh, the cartoonist got upset about this guy named Al Capone. Okay, I thought this was very interesting when I first started looking into Al Capone. How did they get Al Capone? You seen the stories about Elliot Ness? No, it was not Elliot Ness at all. Yeah, he broke up a lot of stills and everything. He caused Al a lot of trouble. But the guy who got him was Frank Wilson from IRS Investigations. And how did he do it? In 1928, he was assigned to do what he needed to do to move down to Chicago, get the information that he could, and get Al Capone. He was <coughs> tired of reading about things like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and all the corruption that's going on. Al Capone would go down to City Hall at least once a day. So he had a lot of payoffs to make. So, how did, how, how did they get the information on it? Okay, this is the same thing we do today. Analyze business records, tracking extravagant expenditures, uncover nominee bank accounts, trace hidden Western Union money transfers, reveal straw buyers, locate and co-op reluctant witnesses. Utilize informants and undercover agents. Okay, all, all of these devices were used in this case. And here's a ledger that they found. You see it better on these side monitors. But here's, uh, it's hard to see on the top, but it says craps, uh, ferro, uh, roulette, horses, roulette. <laughs> Okay, these are, these are some of the scams they had going on here. And these are the payments all written down real nice. And here's where the money went. Here's Al, and here's Guznick, and here's a couple of others. I don't recognize all these names. But that's what started them down the trail, to get the money. And Al, of course, owned not a single piece of property. He didn't own anything of his own. In fact, he didn't even file income tax returns because he had no income. Or so it said. But this seems to say otherwise, doesn't it? So what did they put together what his expenses were by talking to people? 
they've done them for 1924, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And oh yeah, they've got everything from his cabin <laughs> cruiser, he has a mini thing, put in his mother's name or something. Uh, oh, there, look, catering for the Dempsey Tony fight. <laughs> $3,450. What's that worth? About 20 times, 20 times 3,000, you know, $60,000. Custom suits. Here's my favorite, so over here. The Police Widows and Orphans Fund. Look at this. 21,000, 58,000, 30,000, 35,000, 30,000. Political contribution, 9, 6, 36, 39, 34, 16. All this adds up for this five years, uh, more than a million dollars, times 20 to today's dollars, just 20 million, and that's just what they could find out. And this guy says he has no money. He's living off the friendship of his family and his neighbors. Right. Well. Big Al got convicted in 1931, as we've all heard. Got 11 years, but he didn't serve that much, seven and a half years. And prison didn't do good for him because he had syphilis. And within a few years, he had the mind of a 12-year-old child. Died in Miami, age 48. Crime does not always pay. Pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> okay. One of the things we do at our course, I teach a course at George Washington Law School called uh, International Money Laundering, Corruption, and Terrorism. So one of the things we do is we have an exercise. And I'm going to take four minutes to give you a taste of the exercise. So just read this little article we put together from the Washington Post about Barry Backkick. Back kick, get it? Kick back. Okay. said was, hey, there's this government official in Richmond that's in charge of resources over there and contracts, and he's got this $1.8 million house down at the beach, and he's got this Mercedes parked in it, and he makes um, $120,000 a year. How does he do all that? So, if you are like Saul, and you are the assistant U.S. attorney in the 4th District over there, you might say, you better look into this. Your boss comes and throws it on your desk. Hey, we can't be like Madoff and the SEC, right? <laughs> the guys come in and say, well, Madoff is a criminal enterprise and a Ponzi scheme, and uh, the SEC doesn't even look at it, does nothing. Well, we better look into it. So what we've done for this class is we put together 50 pieces of evidence, and you have to follow the money trail from this first little press up. It's kind of like a game. You know, everybody likes to find the treasure, right? So, I'll show you. So the first one would be, let's go to Declaration of Assets. And each one of these is password protected. So what we do is put it down on the student's computer with a thumb drive. They've got all the documents there. But before they can open the document, they have to get the password. And the way to get the password <coughs> is to ask the right question. So the right question you would have asked if you know anything about government is that all senior government employees need to file a declaration of their assets every year. The other thing you'd want to do if your boss told you to look at this guy is look at his declaration of assets, see what his bank account would say. Okay, let's go look at his declaration of assets. <coughs> no, this looks pretty simple. 
the guy's got money in banks and other financial institutions. You're supposed to list all your money. He's got 2500 in the Bank of America, only one account. This is plain vanilla. No problem. <coughs> Real estate, one personal residence. Farms and livestock, nothing else. No accounts, no shares, shares and dividends, nothing. Okay, remember that. This is what Bank Kick says. Under, this is filed annually under penalties of perjury. Okay, so you, the bright and enterprising assistant U.S. attorney, go file a subpoena, get his bank accounts. He says he only has one, so that makes it easy. And in fact, there are, I will show you 270 entries for two and a half years, and you would say, oh, gee whiz, I'm an attorney, not an accountant, and how can I go through 270 entries? And they look pretty innocent to me. Well, here's his salary, here's some Harris Teeter, look at all, it's just, but it's all chronological. How can you make sense of this really quick? I ask my terms. 270 entries. And of course, they all think it's a trick question, it's hard to do, and maybe you have to be an accountant. And, you know, I say no. A lot of this financial investigation is pretty simple and just common sense. It's just like I told you, a treasure hunt. Okay, if it was really a treasure hunt and you wanted to find the treasure, what would you do? Well, anybody that knows an Excel spreadsheet knows that you can do one simple thing really quickly, which is called sort. And here, see there's a little icon up there? In case you haven't used it, that's the sort and filter icon. And look at what it does, just by punching this. I'll put my icon over here on source or disposition. And I'll sort it A to Z. Look at that. Just with clicking a couple of buttons, and I'm not an expert on Excel either, but look at that. I have now grouped everything so I can see it. So, if I go down and I say, okay, let's see anything that looks suspicious. So I can get rid of this case and get on something more meaningful. Payments for electricity. That's not very suspicious. Look at that. ATM withdrawals. See anything suspicious about that? 267, 300, 300. No, nothing suspicious. Uh, Toyota payments. Bank of America, not suspicious, especially since he said on his disclosure that he had a Toyota. Bank mortgage, he said he had a mortgage, and there's the payments, 1,600, not suspicious. Oh, he likes to go to spas, okay, he can spend his money that way if he wants. Huh. What's this? Cash deposits. 4500 That's a lot of money. I wonder where he got that money. Hmm. That wasn't listed on his, on his uh, statement. I'll write that down as something I need to look into. But I still believe it. Restaurants. Oh, look, there's his government salary. Harris Teeter, okay, he likes good food, he spends money on that. Now what's this one? R.G. Horman Brokerage. I don't remember seeing any brokerage on that disclosure firm. He said he had no stocks. Why are they pay, giving him a dividend reimbursement? Well, I better write that down and look into that one too. Ruby's Bar and Grill. Wait, what's the savings account at Bank of America? 972, he didn't say that. 
All of a sudden, he has a checking account. How much money has he put into that account? Eleven thousand nine twenty-one. Oh my goodness! Where's he getting all this money? He only makes one hundred twenty thousand a year. Is he beginning to look a little bit more suspicious to you? Hmm. Maybe there's something that we should be looking at. Okay. Well, one of the first things I do then is I go to Bank of America and I find out about this account. Don, well, how where's that money coming from? How does it get in there? That's a lot of money. I also go back to R.G. Harmon and I ask about this $70. Right here. He's not supposed to have any account there. It's not on his list. Well, when they start following this trail of evidence, they find out that there's a huge amount of money in R.G. Horman, and that happened to be a mistake. Uh, they got that one got sent over there, and that's and what happens a lot of times. Mistakes is how we find out and how we trail the money. So when the students start going through this and start following the trail, they get down to the end and they find out that there's multiple scams, which include deposits in the UK and kickbacks from, from construction companies in Virginia, and, and that there's tens of millions of dollars <laughs> involved in this. And there's a lot more than a Mercedes and house on the beach. So this is just one little exercise we use for the students to get them interested in actually tracing the assets. And you'd be surprised in most law schools, they're not used to doing this. They just read cases. But you have to think and actually do what a logical person would do. It's new to them. In, in your example, why isn't the IRS on it for uh, cash disbursements that aren't showing up? Sure. Distribution? Should there and, have been? And, and an SAR by the bank for all of this cash rolling through. Good point. In fact, uh, they very well could be, or should be. But if you've ever been to uh, FinCEN, all these suspicious activity reports and any currency, any currency transaction over $10,000 is reported. And all of these are gathered in, at FinCEN, which is in, uh, in Northern Virginia, in an interesting building. And I go there, and I, I want to tell you they get a lot of information there. Uh, millions of reports every year. And they haven't quite got figured out how to sift through and pick this stuff up. But I do believe that in a normal case, I would be very pleased that they did pick it up. And they should pick it up. Because he is definitely a politically exposed person. And all of those currency transactions are sort of been filed. Now it could be, if you read the newspapers, you'll find that a number of banks every year get fined because their compliance uh, operations are not up to snuff. <laughs> that, that's a nice way of saying they're not filing their suspicious activities reports like they're supposed to. And some of the fines you'll see have been in the hundreds of millions of dollars. American Express has been fined. Uh, Wachovia has been fined. Citigroup has been fined. So it's just now that in the last couple of years that these banks are beginning to take their compliance obligations more seriously. Okay, that's that exercise. Now I'm going to have to speed along or I won't get done, but this slide I also regard as pretty important. Um, these, this is what you do to recover the money. These are the options that you have. And it's too bad Saul is left because what I think a good asset recovery attorney does is consider his, his actions he can take through the civil courts himself, which are the civil procedures. Uh, but he should also be working through his US Attorney's Office and delivering a case on a silver platter so that he can get the forfeitures going, because why should I spend money on a private attorney if I can get the assistant U.S. attorney to do it? Uh, and criminal restitution.
form of an asset in your Um, I have some items that I have snipped from asset freeze orders. And I'll show you some of those. familiar with asset freeze orders, I'm sure, but I'll say, uh, let me say just a couple of things about that. In the U.S., in the U.K., you can get a worldwide freeze. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So if the guy has, if the bank, um, it's a global bank like Credit Suisse, which has offices in the U.K. and in the United States, you get Barry Backkick or somebody like that that's got accounts there. You freeze them in all the banks worldwide for Credit Suisse. But U.S. courts generally won't do that. Um, they, will issue, they will not issue a preliminary injunction to freeze assets of a defendant that are unrelated to the case, merely to ensure that the defendant will have money to pay a future judgment. So they're not going to do that for you. But what can they do for you? Well, there's this interesting case that came out of the Fourth Circuit a few years ago. And this is pretty much the standard throughout our country. If you want to get a prejudgment freeze on assets, on the defendant's assets, you've got to do these three things. Assert an equitable claim. Equitable claim. Not just a claim for money damages. An equitable claim. <coughs> Demonstrate a sufficient nexus between that claim and specific assets of the defendant which are the target of the injunctive relief. And show that the requested relief is a reasonable measure to preserve the status quo. I, I have a question. How, how do you overcome, because the federal judge is going to look you around the eye and say, can't you just bring a damage claim against the guy? You have that, you have that law rights. Why do I need to give you equitable relief? Well, because that's what we've asked for. It's not for the judge to... Oh, well, you have different that. judges than I say. Yeah, we say, <laughs> this is, I, there's, I've been robbed of a million dollars, and he put it in this bank account here, and it's fraud, and we're asking for this bank account to come back, this particular one, and some judges will give it to you, and some won't. And it depends on how egregious the situation is and how worried they are and how much you can demonstrate that uh, he might or might not dissipate the assets. You got a good case. He's been throwing money around and taking it out of these accounts. You can get it, especially if it's an account that he you can show, trace the assets, and my money went into that account. So the money in that account is my money. So, the answer for these asset freezes is here in America, it's very hard to get an asset freeze, but sometimes you can do it if you put it together just like this. And it happened in this particular case, and it's happened in others. Okay, remember what I said. It's important to figure out the best and cheapest and most efficient way to get your money back. <laughs> Get the U.S. attorney to bring a forfeiture order. Or I can get an in personam forfeiture order, which I can get rescission for, and then all the forfeiture will go back to me. The problem is with forfeitures is that the money is, goes back in its title to the United States government. And it's within the discretion of the attorney general whether to give it to the victims or not. Now, their guidelines do say they're supposed to take every effort to give it to the victims. So you're going to have to file a petition <coughs> to get it back. And I'm running out of time. Uh, if you're interested in how hard, why money laundering, why, why we're getting most of our money back through money laundering cases, and why would you charge somebody like Madoff with money laundering? OK, this is $10,000. This is $1 million. This is $100 million. Drug dealers, people that steal a lot of money, have got a big problem with the disposing of a billion dollars. You just don't put it in a suitcase and walk down the street with it. So I'll, I'll 
the two big statutes that we use, 1956 and 1957. You can all remember 1956, Suez Canal, Elvis Presley, Heartbreak Hotel. Okay. You got to have this. You got a transaction. Okay, what is a transaction? A transaction is nothing more serious than putting the money in the bank. If he's holding on to the money, it's not a transaction. If he puts the money in the bank, or if he gives it to you and tells you to put it in the bank, it's a transaction. Proceeds of a specified unlawful activity, and you'd say, what's an unlawful activity? In some foreign countries, an unlawful activity is murder and rape. And you say, what proceeds are there for murder and rape? Well, there aren't any. Why do you think they wrote it like that? They want to be able to say they have a money laundering statute, but they don't want to give any money back. But not so in the United States. You've got to have knowledge that the property is proceeds of an unlawful activity. And here you have to have purposes to conceal it, evade taxes, promote it. 1957, same thing, <coughs> unlawful activity, but I don't have all these intentions down here. So it's much easier to prove. And this is really designed to get at situations of people receiving money that's uh, part of a specified unlawful activity. OK, you want to know where to find your unlawful activities? Here they are. There's the manual asset forfeiture and money laundering statutes. And they're all listed. So we we'll just thumb through them. Ah, I put a B by this one because I like it. Mail fraud, wire fraud. You're going to see that. It's really easy. If you've got a fraud and you use the mails and the wires, the reason the B is there. Bernie Madoff. How do you think they got that big forfeiture from him? And there is Bernie Madoff. And I'm not going to take time to tell you what he did, because you already know. Sentence, 150 years. Forfeiture, 17.179 billion. And how did they get that? Because under money laundering, you can take you can take everything that was involved in the money laundering activity, or the wire fraud, or the mail fraud. You can take it all. It doesn't have to just be proceeds. You can take everything of a car, house, business, a business. Just think about it. The whole business is business. If it's involved in money laundering, you take the whole thing. And here's the forfeiture allegation. Uh, there's your 1956 and 1957. And what did they forfeit then? All property, real and personal, involved in said money laundering offenses, and all property traceable to such property. Wow. <laughs> so guess what? Bernie doesn't have anything left. Criminal restitution. And we talked about that a little with Saul, so I won't go into that. But the law is uh, <coughs> the Victim and Protection Act of 1982. And this one, Mandatory Victims Restitution Act of 1996. Back in the old days, those <coughs> US attorneys didn't want to help you with restitution, but now they have to. And in fact, there's a, new, a law came out in 1990, gave victims a bill of rights. Before this, criminals had more rights than the victims did. <laughs> but the one I highlighted for you here, right to restitution. Get our restitution. Here it is again. Uh, any offense committed by fraud or deceit, we get full restitution. Fraud or deceit, that's what we're talking about. This is one of my cases uh, back in 1996. We had a restitution order against Tom Nevis. He decided to put his money to something else and not pay the restitution order, and the judge revoked his probation and put him in jail for seven years. So these orders have teeth. You can get your restitution. And in fact, all the US attorney's offices, if you look at their websites, now have stuff like this, which they never had before. Here's the Middle District of Pennsylvania, public corruption prosecutions. Hey, I've got all these cases now. Anybody who's a victim, there's inf you click on it, and it gives you full information about the case. <laughs> and he wants to know if you want to file a victim impact statement. That means, that's a statement, how much money did you lose and, and how did you lose it? Of course you want to do that so that you can get some of the restitution out of this. And so i just talking here. FDIC makes big use of these restitution orders now. 
why should we spend our time and money doing it? Let the U.S. Attorney's Office do it. Of course, Saul would probably say, what am I, a debt collector for the, <laughs> for the FDIC? There's our restitution orders. I would say 400 million since the early 90s. Private civil actions, that's what most lawyers bring. That's what they're used to. The FDIC brings a lot of those. I asked Saul about the parallel proceedings, civil actions. Here's what we collected between 1990 and 1995, 4.4 .4 billion. And this is how it broke down, 1.3 bill on directors and officers, accounting liability, Drexel Milken litigation. Here's the, here's the numbers going back to 1996, $6.2 billion collected. And I think I have gotten, oh, I want to get, I'm not going to go through Enron. I will do this one. These guys, Enron, the University of California shareholders for Enron brought uh, their own suit against these, all these banks. And Goldman Sachs and Kirkland and J.P. Morgan, all these people settled. Uh, Merrill Lynch, Barclays, Credit Suisse, they didn't settle. This is what happened. Uh, the, the Supreme Court came out with a decision in 2008 and said secondary actors such as banks, lawyers, and accountants cannot be held liable as aiders and embedders of securities fraud. Whoa! So what did that mean? That meant that those settlements stood because the money was already paid and these guys, the cases were dismissed. So if you're a lawyer representing a client, you got to think about these things before you get started here. Uh, why would you want to go with a civil action over a criminal prosecution? Corporations do not have Fifth Amendment privilege. Let's remember that. And if any party in a civil trial gets up and says, well, I'm not going to answer that question on the grounds of the Fifth Amendment, guess what? I can get up and argue, hmm, why do you think, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that that guy didn't answer that question? Huh? Forfeitures in realm, cases against the thing. Hey, sometimes we don't want to argue with them. Bernie Madoff's civil forfeiture is a case against the thing. And they brought, just like this, $7,206,000. This is how it was styled. United States of America versus this money on, de on deposit in this bank. So they sued the money. <laughs> they didn't have to sue uh, Picard. What does it do internationally? This is Equatorial Guinea. This is the son of the dictator. He's an agricultural minister. Here's another in rim case. United States of America versus one white crystal covered bad tour glove and <laughs> other Michael Jackson memorabilia. Property located in Malibu. You really like Michael Jackson stuff. Here's the property of Malibu. Forbes magazine said it was the most expensive house purchased in the United States in 2006. Here's a party he had, 700,000 on this yacht. He spent all this money, and the people in that country are among the worst off in the world. 75% live on less than $1 a day. And that's what he's doing. It's only 700,000 people in the country. That's what those kids, that's what they're doing. So this goes back to why should we care? Forests, wars, repatriation. That goes back to Mobutu. Hey, and in the United States, if the assets have been judicially forfeited, the known victims get to file a petition for admission, and you can get the money back. A lot of people in the, around the country and around the world are getting together. This is in Doha, Qatar in 2009, and they're talking about the same issues that we're talking about right now, corruption, what to do about it, and that's it. Thank you.